and uh, and just you know apply it to things that are happening in the world. I mean, there's so much going on in the world, and I'm all the time making uh, those prophetic connections to things that the Word of God said many, 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 many years ago, thousands of years ago. Yet we're the first generation in the history of the planet to see them coming to fruition. Zev Parat is a Messianic rabbi in Tel Aviv, Israel. He has comes from a family of Holocaust survivors and a family of rabbis. He himself was training to be an Orthodox Jewish rabbi when he found Jesus Christ and came to Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, Messiah. And uh, he is now, of course, a born-again Christian and uh, lives in Israel. He's of Europe, in and out of the United States of America. I was just in a conference with him out in Boise. I, I think I'm going to be in a another with him in Dallas coming up in March. But Zev and his precious wife, Lynn, are dear dear friends of mine, and um, they are just just tearing up the, the road for the kingdom of God. And uh, Zev, I'm so glad that you're on with us. There's an eight-hour difference, so I know it's early in the morning there, but thank you for taking this time to be on Freedom Friday. You're, you're going to really, you have already enlightened a lot of folks, and I know what you have to say next is going to be powerful. Thanks for being with us, brother. Well, thank you for having me. Always a blessing, Carl. And uh, one thing I want to bring out uh, from the previous segment that we just spoke. Yes. You know, we're not against anybody. We're just here to proclaim the Word of God and, uh, and truth. And Jesus, that's what Yeshua called us to do. And, and we are to love people, and that's what we do. And, and the Bible says all of us have fallen short of the glory, but through Him we become righteous. I mean, we're not, we're not perfect. We're all sinners in desperate need of a Savior. But having said that, uh, the call to repentance has to be uh, publicly uh, uh, stated out in order for people to wake up. That, that's, that's what it's all about. We're not claiming yeah. to be you know, saints or anything. We're just yeah. uh, righteous through Yeshua. That's yeah. it, through Jesus. It is, brother. And here's the thing, Zev, and I know I can speak for you as well. You and I are not mean-spirited. We are not attackers. I, I, I do all I can to try not to call a name, but... But we are also shepherds, you know? And I mean, and God has put a spirit of boldness in both of the, our hearts. And I mean, I was a cop for 10 years. I've been in the pulpit for 30 years. I've traveled the world. I've preached the gospel in continents, I mean, several continents and around the world like you do. I go into third world countries. I go into first world countries. I go into conference settings. And, and I just, there's so much pure, false teaching and heresy and deception out there. I would be remiss, just like a cop. When I was a cop, if I saw a rape going on in a back alley and just went on by because I didn't want to upset somebody, or if I saw a potential murder or robbery going down, and I just kind of closed my eyes and said, well, I don't want to hurt any feelings. I better just drive on. Well, you know, I, I wouldn't do it then, and I'm not going to do it now. You and I, we get cussed, we get threatened, we get scolded all the time. But, Zev, I don't care. I mean, this is who I am, you know? I'm a preacher of the Word and a shepherd of the flock, and you are too. And so from time to time, we've got to stop and have a show like this just to tell people what's going on and how to protect themselves and their families. We're living in very prophetic times, Ev. What do you think about all that? Absolutely, I'm in agreement with you. We are shepherds, and uh, God is going to call us to, uh, to judgment if we... Uh, hush and be quiet about this. God is going to say, you were quiet, you were... You know, right. We can't do that. Right. We have to put the kingdom first before before anything else. We can't be man pleasers. Right. We have to be God pleasers. Right. We can't be like Saul. Saul was a man pleaser. And you know how he ended up his life. Yeah. And we've got um you, I need to get you to turn the, the volume down a little bit, Zev. It's kicking back on me there. But we've got, um, you know, I was talking to you off air, Zev. Back in 1988, I was a pastor here on the Gulf Coast. And this is before Internet. And there was a, a guy that wrote a book called, in, you know, 88 Reasons Why Jesus is Coming Back in 1988. And that false teaching, that heresy ripped through the church all over America, probably around the world. Oh, man, they were having revivals and thousands of people were, quote, getting saved. I'm making air quotes, getting saved, and all this stuff was happening, and I was just screaming into the wind back in those days. Again, no social media, no internet, nothing like that, no emails and texting and, and, and Facebook, I just, but I was preaching and teaching and on the radio and everywhere I could saying, folks, it's not going to happen. It's not going to happen. The Bible is not a magical incantation book. There are no secret formulas in it for a date for the return of the Lord. But I was lampooned and lamblasted and castigated and lied about back then before internet, but yet 
you know, we were right because we were just standing in the Word. I've not had any of those people come back and apologize to me after all these years, Sam. But the point I'm making is this stuff happens all the time, and that's what you and I are supposed to do is speak the truth to it. Right, brother? Absolutely. Deceive the very elect, if possible. What the Bible says, right? Yeah. Yeah. No, you're right. Hey, listen, before we run out of time, tell us what's going on in Israel. It's now the Feast of Atonement. Tell people kind of what that means, where that comes from, and then the modern-day celebration or practice of it and how you use that to witness the gospel of Jesus Christ. I'm going to be quiet. Believe it or not, I want you to tell the people about all of this, the Feast of Atonement. Give us some good teaching on every every, every part of that. Well, we just finished uh, the Feast of uh, Trumpets, the uh... Uh, Yom Shura, Day of Blowing, and we go into the Feast of uh, a Day of Atonement. We're in that right now, and in a few days we go into the Feast of Tabernacles, the last and final feast, which points to Revelation 21.3 prophetically. Yes. Yes. Behold, the tabernacle of man is now with God forever. Now, the Day of Atonement uh, in Hebrew is called Yom Kippur, yeah. uh, and Kippur actually means covering, so it's the Day of Covering, yeah. because the yeah. sins are only covered, they're not taken away. Only Jesus can take away the sins. The Bible says, John, in John one twenty nine, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. So all these feet are prophetically pointing to the second coming of Jesus. Now, uh, as New Covenant believers, we celebrate it because we know that it brings us into the Feast of Tabernacles. It's a time of preparation. The non-believers, the Jews that are celebrating in Israel and around the world, they don't understand that it's pointing to Jesus, so they still have the covering. So every year... They have a Yom Kippur, they fast for their sins, and then they go and sin again another year, and then they have another covering. God orchestrated these feasts in order to bring them in to Yeshua HaMashiach. What Moses spoke about in Deuteronomy 18 when he said, a prophet from among us will come, you must listen to him. So we're praying that they're going to wake up and, and see the final atonement, Yeshua, Jesus. Me, as a New Covenant believer from an Orthodox background, I don't celebrate the feast, uh, this feast in a way that uh, you know I have to... Uh, ask, uh, you know, fast for my sins, because Jesus already fulfilled that. And I'm not saying that I don't fast. I fast many times a year. But I'm saying that I don't particularly fast on this day uh, because I don't want to uh, align myself with the rabbis. But having said that, I don't go out in the street and eat something and provoke them to jealousy in, in a bad way. So what I do is uh, I understand that it's pointing to the second coming of Jesus. Now, again, Yom Kippur means the day of covering. It's just like a credit card. It just covers your debt temporary until you have to pay for it. The payment was Yeshua HaMashiach on the cross. Yes. Okay, I was waiting. I, I, because of the delay, I wanted to make sure I didn't overstep you. Okay, and that's a good teaching. And, and, and the seven feasts come from, uh, you'll find them in Leviticus 21, folks, if you want to look them up. The seven feasts, there's Passover and Feast of Unleavened Bread and Feast of First Fruits and Feast of Pentecost and Feast of Trumpets and Feast of Atonement and Feast of Tabernacles. And uh, when we come back from our break, and, but that's going to be a few minutes from now, I, I, Zeb, I, you made me think of something about these feasts and, and where the last three might actually lie line up and be foreshadowed in the book of Revelation. We'll talk about that. But before we go to break, very quickly, so tell folks, how is it that Orthodox Jews are celebrating the Feast of Atonement? How are they getting their blood covering right now? How are they getting uh, forgiveness and covering for their sin? And how do you use this odd-sounding thing to people uh, to lead them to Christ or to lead them to the truth of Christ? Well, when they had the sanctuary, the temple, they were sacrificing uh, animals for atonements of sins. Uh, the Holy of Holies, the high priest would go in there. Uh, we know in the book of Hebrews that it says that it is impossible for blood and bulls and goats to take away sins. Only Jesus can. Uh, they don't have the sanctuary right now, the temple. So the rabbis have been teaching for thousands of years that prayer and good deeds replace sacrifice. Then they contradict themselves by sacrificing chickens for the atonement of sins two days before the Day of Atonement. It's happening all over Israel, in Jerusalem, in Bnei Brak, in, in the Hunter Gates, Mass Shalim, is happening everywhere in Israel. And you ask them a question, why are you sacrificing chickens? Number one, chickens were never in the Bible for sacrifice. And they say, well, because we don't have bulls. And number two, if the rabbis are teaching that prayer and good deeds have replaced sacri sacrifice, why are you still sacrificing chickens? Obviously, you understand that there has to be blood for atonement of sins according to the Word of God. Otherwise, you wouldn't be doing it. And this is where they start thinking, and this is really uh, witchcraft. They take a chicken, the, the, the man of the house, the father, he waves it around the, all the people, 
uh, his family members, and then they take the chicken and they give it to the poor to eat. So I always ask them, I said, what do you do with the chicken? They say, we give it to the poor. So I said, so now you're giving a chicken with sins to the poor to eat. And this is where we have a lot of believers, a lot of uh, uh, the Jews coming into faith and becoming believers because they start to think and they start to read, not only not in the Bible, but it's illogical. So it opens uh, opens up the gospel uh, for us to preach here in Israel. And it's really, uh, it's kind of funny to see these chickens being waved around. But their understanding that there has to be atonement of blood for the remission of sins. They know it. Whether they admit it or not, they're doing it themselves. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. That's fascinating stuff. Okay, listen, we've got eight or nine minutes before we're out of here, but let me take a minute or two and set this up, and then I'm going to turn it over to you, and and uh, you just uh, just help us, enlighten us. But here's the deal. So you and I both know, we've talked about this before, and I'm not suggesting that you're going to agree necessarily with everything I say, and I'm telling you in front of the audience, if you disagree or if you have a different insight on this, please share it. I mean, I don't have a problem with it. I don't claim to be the, uh, you know, the all-knowing one on this. But here's the deal. We've said Say that we know that Leviticus 21 outlines the feast of the Lord, the, the feast that, that God gave to Israel when they came out of Egypt and, and were headed to the Promised Land and in the wilderness. And there were seven feasts. We know that the first four feasts were fulfilled per per perfectly in the life of Jesus Christ. Passover, of course, he was the Passover lamb, shed his blood on Calvary's cross on the day of Passover, by the way. The feast of, uh, of unleavened bread, we know he is the bread of life. He is the bread without yeast, without sin. He he is our sustainer in the wilderness, so he fulfilled that. Uh, the Feast of First Fruits that happened on the Sunday after Passover. It happened on the on the on the day of resurrection. We know that 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 the Feast of First Fruits. He was the firstborn from the dead. The, the New Testament says he's the perfect fulfillment of the Feast of First Fruits. We know that after the Feast of First Fruits, you count down fifty days from the Feast of First Fruits, and you wind up on the first day after the first Sabbath, after 49 days, which is the 50th day, which always falls on a Sunday. Now you have the Feast of Pentecost, and that's the day on which the church was born. It's also the day that Israel celebrates the giving of the law. So Israel was born on Pentecost at the giving of the law. The church was born on Pentecost at the giving of the Holy Spirit on the same day. So you've got all four feasts fulfilled in Jesus Christ and the birth of the church, which he promised by the giving of the Holy Spirit. So that leaves three feasts that have not yet been fulfilled in Jesus Christ. That's the Feast of Trumpets, the Feast of Atonement, and the Feast of Tabernacles, Tabernacling with God. Now, you sparked this in my mind a minute ago. Again, I've written to this in final warning, but you sparked it again, Zeph, and that is when you think about it, the first four were all fulfilled in Jesus. They're all talked about in the New Testament, and they're all confirmed that they were fulfilled in Jesus and the birth of the church. But there are no scriptures that specifically point to the Feast of Trumpets, the Feast of Atonement, and the Feast of Tabernacles as being completely fulfilled in Jesus until you get to the book of Revelation. And there we find in Revelation 21, let's start at the end, Revelation 21, Behold, the tabernacle of God is now with men, and there will be no more crying, no more pain, no more tears. The old order of things has passed away. So there it is. There's the last one. Well, where do we find the Feast of Trumpets and the Feast of Atonement? Well, there happens to be a vision of seven trumpets. And at the last trumpet, there's a voice that says, come up here. And they were taken up into the clouds. That's what Revelation means. You know, so, so could that not be this vision of the Feast of Trumpets being fulfilled in the last days? And then you say, well, the Feast of Atonement. Well... After the trumpet's blown in Revelation 11, what happens? It's the outpouring of God's wrath. Who's he pouring it out on? He's pouring it out on those that are not covered by the blood. And so it's like the Feast of Atonement. The great day of the Lord is here. Either you're covered under the blood of Jesus or you're not. And if you're not, you're under his wrath. If you are covered, you're under his mercy and his forgiveness. So I've been preaching and teaching forever that I believe, and I could be wrong, but I believe that the Feast of Trumpets, the Feast of Atonement, and the Feast of Tabernacles are all found in the book of Revelation. Now, that's my belief. If you have a complete disagreement, it's cool with me. I'm going to hush, and you just share what you think about the seven feasts and Jesus and perhaps these visions in Revelation. Absolutely, because in the Feast of the Lord are multiple fulfillments pointing to the second coming of Yeshua Jesus, even the ones that were 
were fulfilled. And Jesus said that even the ones that are fulfilled are not canceled. He spoke about this in the book of Matthew, chapter 5, 17 and 5, 18, where he says, not a dot will be missing. I did not come to abolish, but to fulfill. Uh, Passover, for example. Of course, Jesus fulfilled it. He is the Passover lamb. He died on the cross for our sins, on the tree. Uh, is Passover canceled? Absolutely not, because we, he, he died as the lamb of God, and he gave up his uh, spirit as the lamb of God, and he's coming back as the lion of the tribe of Judah, Revelation 5.5. 5. But we also see in the book of Revelation that he's still the lamb, because it's forever, and that's why it's not canceled. It's foreshadowing the book of Revelation. He's still the lamb in the book of Revelation, although he fulfilled Passover. Uh, so everything in the Old Testament is a shadow of the new, absolutely. The seven trumpets, agreed, it's in the book of Revelation. Yom Kippur, and we spoke earlier that the Jews are, are celebrating Yom Kippur, which is a day of covering, just covering their sins. We have the atonement of sins through Jesus. However, the book of, uh, of Revelation speaks about the judgment, and the atonement is preparation for that day of the opening books and gates. Absolutely. That's also implanted in the Feast of the Lord in the idioms. Uh, Passover is called the barley harvest. Pentecost is the wheat harvest, but tabernacles, Revelation 21.3 is called the grape harvest, and this uh, takes us to Revelation 14, uh, where it speaks uh, about uh, trusting your sickle uh, for the earth uh, is, is fully reaped, for the harvest is coming in. This talk about the grape harvest. So the last feast is called the grape harvest, and that's Revelation 14, pointing to the eternal tabernacle with Jesus, with Yeshua. Uh, that's why grapes are also judgment, the wine press. We see this also in, 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 in Megiddo and Armageddon, but it's also a, the blessing. The, the Bible says that Yeshua is the vine and his father, the father is the gardener. In Hebrew, it doesn't say gardener. It says that the father is the waterer because yeah. water comes from heaven. Yeah. And in fact, the word water in, he, in Hebrew is the word uh, mine, which comes from the word shamayim, which is heaven. Yeah. So it comes from heaven, the blessing, and absolutely all the feet of the Lord point of the book of Revelation, the second coming of Jesus, even the ones that were fulfilled. That's amazing. That's amazing, Zev. Man, we gotta have, we're going to have you back soon, and we're going to talk about all this and so much more. There's so much going on in the world. Thank you for your time tonight. Go to bed. Get some good sleep. Give your precious wife our love. Thank you for the ministry that you have around the world. Thank you for standing so boldly, my brother. Zev Peratt. God bless you, Zev. God bless you, and thank you for all you're doing for the kingdom. And let's bring in that last harvest together as the one new man. Amen. See you next Friday, folks.